is um, what I wanted to do this second part. Let's, let's go ahead and turn to Philippians first, Philippians 2. And I want to read a couple of scriptures. <clears throat> um, let's just read um, the six words that are in verse 5, first six words, Philippians 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you. And then verse 7, but made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. <clears throat> and then over, um, keep your place here in Philippians, but if you'll turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Um, and verse 1 and 2. Or three, one through three. Uh, let's go all the way to four. <clears throat> okay, First Corinthians, chapter two, verse one. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech, or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling and my speech and my preaching were not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but the demonstration of the spirit and power. And of course, <clears throat> uh, if you're not familiar with the first chapter that set this chapter up, the power spoken of there is the power of weakness. It's what he calls the power of, of the cross, the power of weakness. And, and he describes it pretty well in that first chapter. <clears throat> but what I'd like to do is read something to you that I wrote a lot of years ago. Um, and I don't think I've ever read it to you. But... Uh, the title of it is called Defining God by the Cross. So I'm just going to take the time to read this, and it <clears throat> might be a little flowery because as I reread it, I went, hmm. Anyway, <clears throat> I'm just going to give it to you the way it is. There are many religions and many gods of those religions. All of them have some sort of symbol that supposedly best suits them and their glory. For some, the vastness of space is pointed to as representative of their fullness. One of the gods of Egypt has the bright burning life and a light giving sun to best represent himself. Other people sacrifice to gods by making offerings before a mighty volcano which shakes their world and puts fear in their hearts. The 300 million gods of India take on a myriad of forms and images. But among the gods and deities that have been set forth for mankind to consider, only one is known as the God of the cross. Though stories of old have told of gods experiencing death and then resurrection, none have displayed such weakness, infamy, and shame as that had at the cross of Jesus Christ. All other gods who experienced death and resurrection rose in order to prove their power. But in the case of Jesus, God exalted a defamed, a cursed one, who was rejected by his own people and set him at his own right hand. And none other among the gods have held up death as their main point of identification. So we see that of all the ways he chose to best represent himself, he chose death on a cross. He is the God who hung on a cross. And I'm out, I add, he's the crucified God. <clears throat> he is a crucified God, and that fact will never be separated from his identity. That cross has become the very symbol of this God and of all who follow him. If Jesus is God, then the God that has been presented to us is a crucified God. 
And every person who will come into relation with this God will have to do so on the basis of this cross. He said it to be so. The pinnacle breakthrough that man has had in experience in this God was when he sent his son to us. But frankly, just having mankind experience a glorious relationship with God was not the primary reason he sent him. This God knowingly sent him to be crucified by evil men. It was for this kind of crucifixion that he came. Why is this the case? Well, most people will tell you that God did this to save man from sins and punishment due to sin. But if that were the primary reason, then once salvation was bought, then we could move on to knowing him as he eternally is and not based primarily on a work done within time. However, this God never seeks to shed the connection he has with the cross. Even in the book of Revelation, we see thrones before him and all the saved beholding, not a victorious Messiah raised to wholeness, but a little lamb as though it had been slain, as noted in the Greek text. God did send his son, but not simply to teach us correct doctrine or to be a good example as to how one should live, but to show us God. You see, the cross was not singularly just a tool, but was and is a point of identification by which he would have men know his inner essence and the eternal being. For those who desire to go beyond just seeking him for salvation, but wish to, but wish to know this God with any intimacy at all, they must return to the cross in order to make their discovery. And if we look close enough, what do we discover? We see him reconciling that which hated him. Jesus accepted the blame from those who were actually guilty, but he did it on behalf of the guilty. We also see him taking what was rejected by reason of worthlessness and turning them into intimate family members. We see him redeeming the ungodly. While all of that is incredibly wonderful, we tend to miss the most important part. In all this, we may only focus upon what would benefit us, but we may miss the part that would better help us to know him in his eternal essence. However, if we would look closer, then what do we see? We see that he does all these wonderful things at the expense of himself. He dies, yet... Sadly, the greatest thing that captures our attention is that we live. The pure, holy Son of God is dragged through the greatest shame that men could put him through, but all we bask in is the glory of what that results in for us. But let us ask, what is the problem with taking such a stance as this? The answer is that we are in danger of missing the very character of the one upon whom we shower our praise. It is in the crucifixion we discover his true character and comprehend this specific deity that we call God. The cross reveals God. That means that the full definition of this God is now inseparable from crucifixion for he is now literally defined by it. The New Testament has declared Christ crucified as the proper way for defining our understanding of God. He is a God who desires to be comprehended and embraced within the concept of a crucifixion. We could say it is the crucified Jesus who reveals the true nature of what divinity consists of. From the cross forward, God never presents an exalted Jesus unless he is vitally connected to the crucifixion. It is significant that Paul does not know Jesus after the flesh, but knows him after the cross. This means that Paul does not put Jesus on an equal footing with God, but literally makes the crucified one the definition of God or the express image of his person. 
Paul gives more credence to Christ crucified than any other subject. He does not use the crucifixion as a means to get to the destination that is God, but as the destination itself. Paul talks about the Jesus he is presenting. Um, let's see. Paul, when Paul talks about the Jesus he is presenting, he is presenting Christ as the embodiment of the spirit of the cross. Uh, and then I just wrote one last sentence before another section of something I wrote. Jesus died to save his murderers. All right. Um, within the last year, I wrote just a few little paragraphs here based on Philippians <clears throat> uh, in my study of Philippians. And I call it the definition of God by the cross. When we read Philippians 2, we must ask, what did God exalt to the throne? He exalted a lamb. He exalted a lamb that was the symbol of the altar, the symbol of the cross. As we stated, the one who sits there is the express image of God. Book of Revelation, chapter 5. That's the express image of God. But he's not just a lamb, but a slain lamb. God wants to be known by the cross. Jesus' whole existence while here on earth was that of self-emptying, but all culminated in its greatest expression and pinnacle, which took place by means of his death on the cross. So in order that we may more clearly know him by means of the cross, God has given us the highest example of what he is like. That example is found in Philippians 2, 6 through 8, where we see Jesus as self-abasing, self-giving, and willing to go into death for those who are completely unworthy of such actions. This means that by having all creation declare that Jesus is Lord based on such willingness to empty himself, God is telling the world that this Jesus is now the new definition of God, that to know God is to know him by a crucified Christ. He's Lord. This crucified one is raised to be Lord. And by the way, we will really get into that later <clears throat> and really show that to be the case. Um, therefore, we must conclude that this selfless description set forth in Philippians 2 is not just a principle of, upon which God is guided. It is the master description of his being. Therefore, Jesus' exaltation gives us a picture of a new meaning by which God also wants to be exalted. No longer based upon the fact of God being more powerful or more glorious, more everything than man or any other thing that ever existed. Instead, God now wants to be known for his exaltation based upon his deep selflessness. From now on, the identity of the God of the universe and creator of all things and his exaltation by mankind will be founded solely upon the depth of his humiliation briefly described in verses 6 through 10. It is before this God that every knee is now to bow. He is telling us that this kind of gloriousness belongs to God only if this kind of humility belongs to him. No other basis of glorying will be allowed. The book of Revelation is full of glory and honor based solely upon this lamb, that was slain. God's exaltation of this portion of Jesus, the humbled, crucified one, is saying to us all that he puts the highest premium upon this as God and expects all of creation to do so also, meaning every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. His exaltation of this crucified Jesus also says that this Jesus is now the definition of God and the de definition that he wants man to have concerning himself. That definition is that Christ crucified is 
his express image. Hebrews 1 is trying to communicate this by combining his image in Christ crucified with what it is that he is exalting before all mankind. All right. So, um, to, to enter into a study of Philippians, and it's not just found in Philippians, but to enter into a study of Philippians isn't just to discover what Jesus did for us. It's not even to discover the extreme humility. And, and I usually don't use that word. I almost always use the extreme humiliation because that is more true of what Jesus suffered. Extreme humiliation. <clears throat> and yet... He knew what he was entering into, you know. What, you know, what shall I say then? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I. This is why I can. You see, and that's why I began that first thing that I read to you on that basis. That this is, this is why I came. And this moment is going to be the highest expression of the essence of God compared to anything else that I've done. <clears throat> and um, so Jesus, um, and, and you know, in my mind, because you know, I've been studying on this for a long, long time now. <clears throat> um, I had to separate the event of the cross to what the reality of the cross was trying to, to uh, communicate. All right, but then I had to separate what I thought the reality of the cross was trying to communicate from the work of the cross for mankind and the purpose for God revealing himself his essence. And so I, I wandered through a maze of human thinking, of theology and everything, because it's like, okay. <clears throat> I mean, you know, one of, the, one of the first things that really hits you, if you're a thinking person, you read the book of Revelation and you go, if Jesus, you know, what is Jesus doing sitting on that throne in resurrection? This is resurrection, why is he displayed, or the image of him as seen there, why is he displayed not just as a lamb, but as, and as uh, you check it out in the Greek, as a slaughtered lamb, which, which rightly so. I mean, you know, as a slaughtered lamb. Okay? And then my mind had to begin to divide out the difference between slaughtered lamb for sin, which were the sin and trespass offering, and sweet savor offerings, which weren't, had nothing to do with sin. They were self-giving or represented God's self-giving apart from anything wrong or any need or even hu apart from humans. Even apart from humans. <clears throat> and it's that, it's, it was through that, you know, you can see how that's like a, you know, a maze that you're working through. And that's how I found Philippians 2 to be what it was talking about because there I had shed uh, and when I say shed no that's not a right word I, I had separated out the things that always presented themselves as the cross um, when they were only an aspect of the cross the cross being at before I before God had brought me through some of this stuff, the cross being simply Jesus died on the cross to save sinners. Okay, that's as, that's as simple as you can get, and that's you know we all believe that, and I don't have a problem with that. That's the sin offering aspect of what Jesus died for, but that's not the that if Jesus fulfilled all sacrifices, and the Bible says he did. What about all these sweet savor, sweet savor? 
offerings that were going up. You see what I'm saying? And what about all that? Well, and, then, and then not only what about all that, but if you want to get in behind the veil, you have to ask the right, you have to ask questions and you have to say, okay, what about that? What, where is that at the cross, Holy Spirit? Help me to see. Help me to see. All right. Well, uh, what God does not do is give you a vision of that. He's going to reveal that in the word based on the actual cross, whether it be in the Gospels or like Philippians or Romans. Remember we talked in one of our classes previous that, you know, Romans 6 is all about the cross, but it has nothing to do with your sins. And it has nothing to do with the devil being the problem. It's about you, your old nature being crucified. Okay. So that, so then it's like having this circular table or half circle table in front of you and having to lay the pieces of the offering out, you know, because they, you know, the priest would take the, the lamb and he would cut him up and, you know, cut him up in pieces and lay it out on the altar. And then God would, you know, well, I fear that in our minds we're, we're, we're coming to God and we're offering him Christ crucified, but we're not. We're offering him um, uh, uh, the cross of Christ. And some of you know uh, the definitions. I've gone through that. Many of you may not. <clears throat> the cross of Christ meaning what he did for us. And there's a lot of work in that. I mean, you know, I mean, he for our salvation, for our healing, for, you know, all sorts of stuff, you know, in relationship to that. And it's all wonderful. I mean, we never want to take away from that. But we never want that to stay the one focus of our heart. We never want, we want the fullness of the Lord. We want the full counsel of God. You're not going to get that by just rehashing the same truths that you know we've been taught year after year after year do you understand what i mean by that just say this it's kind of like you never really learn anything new you just get to shout amen a lot you know some of you remember the story when we were on bolivar and you know uh some we had some guest speaker come in and share because i was going to be gone and when i came back i went I saw uh, a brother, and I said, well, how did the service go? And he said, oh, man, it was great. And I said, really? Of course, you never want to hear that when you're the pastor, that it was great. You know? I said, well, you know, uh, what do you mean? And he goes, uh, he goes, well, man, while he was preaching, we were all getting a to shout amen, amen. And he said, with you, it's kind of like, you know, you say something, and, go, you know, and then maybe two weeks later, you're driving your car, and you go, amen, you know. Uh, <clears throat> You know, <laughs> and or two years later, <clears throat> um, but um, we want the full counsel of God, and we want God's definition of that, not Randy Nussbaum's or New Creation's definition of that either. I mean, that's that's where we have to not just get past the theology of what we've been taught. We've got to get past our surroundings, and you know, the pastor and the we have to. We have to go in heart to the Lord and want him to, you know, we want Jesus to break that bread and give it to us. He took the bread. He broke it and he blessed it. You know, I mean, we always bless it and then break it. You know what I mean? I mean, if you go to a meal and you got bread there and you go, you know, Father, bless, you know, and then, you know what I mean? But, but he, he, that was his body broken that he gave to us. He didn't just give us his body. He gave us broken body. Christ crucified again. You see that same lamb, that same spirit. And that bread represented the lamb. Remember, it was Passover. Remember? Same day, Lord's Supper, Passover. We'll call it what you want. It was all on the same day. And, it was, and the Lord's Supper or communion only was the spirit of what that represented. 
eat, let's eat lamb. Let's not talk about it. Let's not just let him die for us. Let's put that on the inside of us. All right. So, um, so uh, you know, the, the journey, and I don't, I don't claim to have <laughs> arrived by any means. And not only that, I don't want to have arrived by any means. You know what I mean? This has been, this has been going on. Honestly, I was trying to figure it out, and it's eight or ten years now where it's been solid of me just trying to really draw into this. And uh, I know that I, I've just barely scratched the surface. But, it, but even the little way that I've made through the maze has been difficult because of this right here. My conceptions and all the things that I held dear, and why, why wouldn't I hold the cross that benefited me as so dear, okay? Okay, but can you, can you accept that maybe there could be some selfishness in our hearts when we do that? Not that the whole thing is selfish, we should be thankful, amen. But, I mean, couldn't there be a little bit of stuff going, you know, uh, yeah, you know, I'm going to heaven, and, you know, and maybe even look down our nose at other people. Well, the very, see, that is like a message to us. That should be a red flag that comes up out of that piece of the lamb that was sliced up and set on the altar that in the very midst of glorying in his death that saved us, we're glorying somehow in ourselves. That means there's got to be more meat. There's got to be more communion. There's got to be something that takes away all of this junk, too. Does that make sense? I mean, there, I mean, I see that as a red flag in me. It's like, uh-oh, still living. Got it. There's more cross. There's more Jesus. There's more reality, and I want that. See, I, I'm not one that's running and fighting and going, I don't want to die. You know, I'm, I'm running as fast as I can toward this. Not for you to make you believe anything. I mean, you're going to believe what you want, and that's fine, and I really don't have a problem with that. You might. <laughs> eventually <laughs> but I don't you know my deal is you know Paul put it this way follow me while I follow Christ if I keep really genuinely following Christ then I believe stuff will you know flow down and pour down the oil and it goes down the bottom and reaches good the whole body gets it you know that's my place is to just put him first and that little sign that was put up there, you know, in focus, be in focus with him. So anyway, there's, there's been this, uh, um, confusion much of the time through this part that I've already gone through and, and somebody said, well, confusing, that's, that's, that's the devil or, you know, that's wrong. You know, all confusion is, is, you know, there's no confusion if there's one voice you're listening to. Confusion starts when you get another one or a couple more. The more you add, the more confusing it gets when you try to do them all. Okay. So the confusion was that I had an, a, a voice louder than the Lord's voice, if I can put it like this, and it was the voice of everything I had learned up to this point. <laughs> you know? It was... And it was, it, the, here's the thing, it wasn't wrong. It just wasn't the fullness of Christ. Not that, again, not that I have the fullness of Christ, you know. Um, and, and I certainly didn't have it in my understanding because I would get thrown or I would go, well, what? You know, just like I said, what's that? Why is that, la I'll, I'll never forget going, why is that lamb on the throne. I mean, I go all the way back, folks. I can go back to my first six months as a Christian, and I remember reading in, in what was it, Numbers or something, and he says, you know, put a, put a brass serpent on a pole and lift it up, you know, and everybody that looks at it, you know, you know, and then Jesus quotes that, you know, in John 3. <laughs> like the brass serpent was lifted on the pole, Whosoever believeth in me shall not perish, you know. And I, I remember just six months old and going, God, why would you 
put a symbol of Jesus as being some serpent on a pole. You know, that's just, he ain't no serpent. You know, and being indignant and all this kind of stuff. But it was, you know, I was trying to protect Jesus. You know, anybody ever done that? You know, well, he, he can't take care of himself. He needs me to stand up for him and, and rebuke all the Pharisees. All right, so just a different level and different phase when I got to Revelation 5. And I, and I, you know, it, it, a lot of times when I read the scripture, it's like I'm there, and I'm not talking about visions or anything, but it's like I'm there. And when I read, was reading that, and it said who, you know, and there's weeping and there's all this confusion, there's strong people and they're not adequate and they're angels and they're good, but they ain't good enough and all that. And I'm just kind of going, you know, heaven's pretty much messed up like earth. That's what I thought. Well, it is if Christ isn't the, one, if the central figure, not just Christ, the lamb slain. And as I said, it was like I was standing there and, and this strong angel says to John, and I'm just kind of, you know, I don't know nothing. I'm just like, you know, hope nobody notices me up here, you know. And he says, you know, the, the line of the tribe of Judah, and I, this is honest truth. The image flashed in front of my mind of a lion and a strong lion and of a, you know, just a, he was just going to rip and tear and, you know, I'll do it, you know. He's you wimpy, strong angel, give me that, you know, or something, you know, and show all of his strength and all of his power. And, and, I, and then when he turned and he saw a slaughtered lamb, I was just like, what is this? God, why would you portray Christ in resurrection? That's how you would portray him in death. He's on a throne here. We're in heaven. You following me? And I'm going, this is, something's wrong with this. Yeah, right here, my head. That's what was wrong. And I couldn't, really, it was like I couldn't grasp. It was like there was something wrong with my brain. I tried to shove that in there, and I just couldn't see it. Well, folks, just because I can't see it doesn't mean that it's wrong. You know what I mean? I don't, to be, for nothing ever to be wrong or for me to understand, I have to understand all things, everything, to be able to go, oh, that's right, that's wrong, that's, you, you know what I mean? And I don't. I mean, I, I, you know, I've got a thimble worth so far, and it's not enough. So, so I have to admit, well, then I don't know, and that's when I go to the Holy Spirit every time. And I just say, Holy Spirit, I mean, I was, I remember one time I was, I remember one time I was trying to prepare for a special service conference, something. And I mean, the thing was on me that night. I was supposed to preach and it was, you know, there was people dependent on me to really bring the Lord. <clears throat> And I mean, I've got a couple of hours, and I'm just like, you know, this is, you know, so I'm really going through it. <clears throat> and so I just asked the Holy Spirit, you're going to have to help me here, because I just, I ain't getting it, you know. And I was in a particular place, and I felt like he, he that's where the dove had landed, but he, he covered it up with his wings <laughs> instead of went, look, you know. And I'm going, come on, would, could you move that feather right there? <clears throat> and... Um, I mean, it got like, it was like five, ten minutes before I was, it was about ten minutes before I was supposed to go out the door and go do this. And I mean, he just fluttered, he just came and he just opened those scriptures and he showed me Christ in such wonderful, glorious ways. And I was just like, you know. I said to myself, oh, thank you, Holy Spirit, so much for helping me. And, and he goes, I didn't really do this to help you. <laughs> I went, what? And he said, look, 
I only want Christ lifted up. And if I'd have not done this, you'd have gone out there and just said a bunch of junk. And it wouldn't have lifted up Christ. It wasn't about you and me blessing you. And you know what I mean? You, you, are you following? So it, was, it wasn't about, you know, me uh, showing you stuff. So And I could go, oh, thank you, Holy Spirit, for helping me. He said, I was sent here to glorify Christ. He says, you know, and he didn't say this, but he could have well said it. You know, I, I know your heart. I know you want to lift him up. But you needed to learn that I'm not just sitting here moving. It's not me and you are good buddies in that. I'm, and we are. I feel very close to the Holy Spirit. But the important issue, see, it's dividing out the real issues of things. The important issue is, is that he wants Christ glorified. And if I will put myself in a position for him to open the word, he'll do it. But I, from that, don't need to take from that that he helped me as much as you are so faithful, Holy Spirit, to lift up Christ. You're amazing. Can you feel the glory that goes up then? Because he gets glory because he's glor he glorified Christ. That's the only thing that gives him glory. And when we see that and acknowledge it, then that's glory to him. See, And we get out of the equation. Well... You know, this, this, uh, this maze was imperceivable on certain fronts because to, um, to just get to the point that the cross had more to do than just stuff for us was a big Christian leap. Okay, but then to move from that to this cross is supposed to be showing you the essence of what God is. You want to know the, remember what I read in the first part? You want to know God? You want the definition of God? God defines himself by the cross. And he's, of all the gods, he's the only God that defines himself by the cross. You know. And like I said in that that I read, there are, you know, I've had people say to me, well, you know, as people aren't saying, there are, there are a lot of gods that died and came back and rose from the dead. And I said, yeah, but how many of them, you know, how many of them came and allowed those people to do that? They, they, you know, it's like they snuck up on them and something and killed them, but then they came back and they said, ah, and I'm strong. You know, it came back to prove their power and prove that they're, the most powerful, you know, God and all this kind of stuff. I said, how many of them came to die and to give themselves and that they wanted to display their weakness, not, not all their strength, you know? <clears throat> and so they embraced it. They didn't, they weren't maltreated uh, the way Jesus was. Anyway, so try to wrap this up. Just um, this thing of, of Philippians, uh, and particularly Philippians 2, although Philippians 3 is Paul's version of Philippians 2. Philippians 2 is Christ's version. Philippians 3 is Paul's version. And, and he, he goes right down the line, just exactly down the line with the same spirit and the same thing. Uh, you know, makes me want to jump ahead here and, and just point out a few little points. But, but uh, um, so one of the things, and I have been, you know, I've got so much notes over so many years of studying this that I'm trying to bring them together now. And, uh, but one of the areas that I really desire to finish up and, and share with you is this truth clearly from the scriptures clear cut that the death of Christ is greater than the resurrection 
And I believe I've, I believe the Lord has shown it to me in the scriptures where I, I won't be, you know, swinging, you know, darkly, not knowing what I'm hitting. I think I'm going to know because Philippians proves it, but Philippians is not the only place that proves it. And I'll just say this, that until the Holy Spirit began to really open my eyes to this, there was no way that I could believe anything other than that the resurrection was the greatest thing because the resurrection benefits me a whole lot. You see? So why wouldn't I, as just a human being and a selfish person, why wouldn't I go, yeah, the resurrection is way better. But not to God. Not to God. Not to God. And we'll get into that because it's not, uh, it won't be one class. <laughs> and, they'll, and there's still there's still a whole lot in this Philippians 2, just the, those few verses that I must cover that uh, we're going to get into. So anyway, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this time. And Lord, I thank you that uh, you have released a spirit of uh, hunger and a desire for Jesus beyond just fixing our problems or changing our life down here, but of revealing yourself, of a veil being rent, and what we see there on the other side is you, and we see you for the first time, not hear and then form visuals of you. So, Father, we ask you to allow the Holy Spirit to do that wonderful job that he's called to, to glorify Christ. And in so doing, we'll find ourselves one with him and rejoicing that he gets all the glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're dismissed.